Hey, Working Preachers, this is Matt Skinner. Our fall campaign is off to an amazing start, and I'm grateful for all of the people who have stepped up to support this ministry. Your support provides new podcast episodes each week for both narrative and revised common lectionary preachers around the globe. Your gifts make an immediate impact for millions of people when biblical preaching is so desperately needed. And now we need your support during this campaign to ensure that these resources continue to be available at no cost to all of our users. A gift of $125 will provide one new podcast. Any gift to the fall campaign will unlock a free ebook titled Digital Jazz. Go to workingpreacher.org before October 31st to double your impact and have your gift matched dollar for dollar. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on October 23rd, 2022, are these. Jeremiah chapter 14, verses 7 through 10, and then 19 through 22. The semi-continuous reading is from Joel chapter 2, verse 23 through 32. There's also a complimentary first reading, which is from Sarek, 35, verses 12 through 17. We won't be speaking about that today, but there is a commentary that will be on the website. Our psalm is Psalm number 84, verses 1 through 7. Our second reading is from 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, and then 16 through 18. And our gospel this week is Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Great parable, isn't it? We've been feeling good about the parables the last few weeks, haven't we? But this yeah. is another good one. <laughs> yeah, these are just classic Luke. And, uh, and I think this one, I've got, I'll name one entry point. Uh, and I've got a couple of others, but the first is, is there, if there is a way homiletically to have people think about God, I thank you that I am not like other people. And then what would fall after your colon? Uh, and what is it that you know, to, 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 to get people to admit that the, how often they think like this? Um, yeah. How often is it? What are what are the what are their thieves? What are their rogues? What are their adulterers? Or even like this tax collector? Mm -hmm. And uh, and to uh, yeah to supplement those those terms with their terms and just to the acknowledge the way in which we uh, that we do that kind of comparison and that sort of. Uh, self blessing of our of, you know of ourselves uh, particularly when it comes to the way in which we want to pitch ourselves or put ourselves before God and why is it that God would bless us and not others uh, I think that's one angle into this story that I think is important this can be an opportunity for the preacher to get on the bad side like Jesus often did you know, Jesus' uh, stories, um, as much as we appreciate them in their familiarity and how we've tried to live our lives according to them, um, when they were first heard, they were not received with, oh, that was a great story. Can't wait till you come over next weekend. We'll have beer in here again. Um, this is, this. I think if we do what you're inviting, Caroline, is an opportunity for us to recognize, yes, that we do this all the time. And to underscore, that is not how God is evaluating us. God is not evaluating us according to someone else's uh, righteousness. And so um, I may not drink or dance or, you know, hang out with those that do. I forgot how to do that Southern line. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't drink, I don't dance, and I don't chew, and I don't hang out with those that do. Something like that. Um, that's not, you know, that's not what God is going to judge us on. There are attitudes of our heart. There are uh, ways that we interact with other people. There are things that we have not done 
that God has given us the opportunity to do that we have left undone. Those are the things that we need to be attentive to. Um, so uh, this might be, if, if you're preaching from Luke's parable this week, um, I'd be prayed up to say this might be a sermon where folks maybe shouldn't be so happy with me at the end of in, at the end of the service. Yeah, I think there's parts of the parable that that you almost have to pause for laughter if you're reading it in the first century because you know, most parables have some absurdity in them and absurd characters. And both of these are, are caricatures in some ways that, that, you know, the Pharisee talks about fasting twice a week. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you're supposed to fast twice a week. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the language of, I give a 10th of all of my income is literally a 10th of everything I bring into my, so it's more than just what I, what he earns, but everything that would pass through his hands or his, or his home he's tithing. So to talk about, you know, a kind of piety on steroids here. <laughs> right. And then you've got this tax collector who's, you know, find your, your modern example, you know, of a guy like a tax collector, right? Organized crime, something. I mean, he's, he's taking advantage of his own people for the sake of the occupying force. And all he says is, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Mm hmm doesn't say, sorry, doesn't say I'm not going to be tax collecting anymore. <laughs> just praise for mercy. There's, there's kind of a people like, yeah, right. That's the worst prayer for a person like that to pray. And, yet, and then the end of the story is, of course, that's all he has to pray. That's a legitimate prayer. So the, you know, there's a few parables out there that have grace that is so disgustingly undeserved, right? Like the prodigal son, or the uh, the workers in the vineyard in in Matthew twenty, I believe it is, or, or like or this as well, where you're just you can't run a universe like this, God. You can't go <laughs> dispensing forgiveness to somebody who just says, "Be merciful to me," who's who's such a a, a horrible person. Or uh, but yet God that. does, right? Yet, yeah, yet and yet God, yet, does. yet God does. So it's to play that up uh, and to there's do that while avoiding. I'm sorry, there's I missed no that. I'm sorry. There's no works righteousness here. I think there's not. Yeah, and but I, I think that's probably true with the Pharisee as well. I mean, it's there's, it's really tempting to turn this into an anti-Semitic parable, and, mm -hmm. and maybe it was at one level originally, but but you can't turn this as Pharisee equals all Jews equals self righteousness, or, which has been the the cheap and easy way to, to, to do this, to do this parable for, for too long. Um, I don't know. I'm really, I, I'm really provoked by uh, AJ Levine's book, short stories by Jesus deals with this parable. And she makes the case that, that both of these men go home justified that the, hmm. that rather than is a bad translation of hmm. the, of the hmm. participle. Um, hmm. I'm sorry, the preposition para, which would mean alongside of, Mm -hmm. in most settings that they mm -hmm. both leave justified, which is offensive as well mm -hmm. <laughs> from, from a, my Protestant perspective that wants to make the Pharisee into some kind of, you know, guy who thinks he can piety his way into the kingdom or something. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. but nothing about what he says necessarily takes me that direction. That's my, that's my Protestant tradition whispering mm -hmm. in my ear, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing, another thing about this parable is to what extent we have a tendency to look at parables like this in a certain sort of in, uh, an instructionary way that we're going to learn something rather than be, rather than be disrupted. Uh, Feel and, something. Yeah. And that we're going to learn something. And so how verse 11 becomes that, that kind of place where, he was praying thus. And so like one, I think one really sort of simplified interpretation of this passage is, okay, don't pray like he did, you know, uh, and, but you've already exposed, right, Matt, the hyperbole in this. And so it's, so that, that also indicates it's not, it's not about how do you pray, uh, but that, that our, what we pray and, and, and what the kind of stance that we have in our prayer is indicative of who we think God is yes. and our relationship with God. 
and our assumptions about God, that prayer is, is, yeah, is a, a way in which those, our theology gets exposed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so the, our, our core sort of theological commitments then sh- will shape how we pray and what we pray for and when we pray. Mm-hmm. And I think that maybe would be an interesting sermon on this text as well to get people to think about that correlation between their theological beliefs or theological commitments. Mm-hmm. And then how does that get articulated in when and how they pray? Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, that's, I think that's really a key aspect of this passage. If I dare push us, there's almost a flip to that if we move to the Jeremiah text. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I I think it's another sense of, you know, what is our theology? What is our faith? Um, And I I just have to say, I did appreciate uh, Andrew Weimer's um, commentary on this uh, and just the questions that he leads in. Are there limits to God's forgiveness, which fits with um, the parable but really moves us into uh, the Jeremiah text, um, mm-hmm. uh, which, which calls out our iniquities, our sins testify against us. But God, where are you? We're calling for you. Um, it really speaks, I think, to what you were just saying, uh, Caroline. So we can use the same question if we were, teach, uh, if we were preaching from the Jeremiah text mm-hmm. uh, of what does this say about our theology and how we pray, how we speak to God and what we ask God, uh, uh, ask of God. I think the same thing is in this Jeremiah text. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and where does that assumption come from? And uh, that's why I think where the conversation is going right now is really profitable that even if it's not part of your sermon, but for preachers to think about that, right? Where do these assumptions of God's, um, either God's limits or the 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 <laughs> the excesses, what appear to be excesses of God's grace, look like, and because there are biblical texts like this that say mm-hmm. don't. So how do you talk about this extravagant, offensive forgiveness that might be on display in the parable without mm-hmm. short selling sin and the power of sin and the destructive mm-hmm. nature of sin? Mm-hmm. Right. Because I don't think God, uh, I don't think the Bible lets us get away with that. Mm-mm. Absolutely. And that's not just an Old Testament versus New Testament thing. No, no, no. 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 no that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Joel? Yeah, if you decide to do prophets, now you're now you're in for it because you got to do it. <laughs> oh, but well, only for one Sunday, so you know. Yeah. It's not too late to call in the guest preacher. <laughs> to get it's yeah. just a hard book, right? We have no idea where this book comes from. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, and it's here you, I mean, it, and we've talked about this before, right? That we, uh, we, you know, what do we do with a, a passage like this where, 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 where we don't, there's no continuity. There's just, this just dropped down in Joel. And what do we know about Joel? And the answer is nothing. And so what do we, <laughs> what do we, what do we preach it or not? Uh, but uh, if you do, and, 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 and also you don't want your sermon to turn into a, um, some sort of, lesson on, you know, Joel as the prophet. And this is everything you need to know about Joel because everybody would fall asleep. But, uh, but maybe, you know, the one, the recognizing perhaps aspect of this text would be the way in which it gets incorporated into Peter's sermon in Acts 2. Mm-hmm. And so, which, uh, you know, is there is there a way that there's, you know, there's something about this particular passage that, uh, and what and what Joel is doing here that that you can show that kind of um, you know continuity into Acts and so something along those lines maybe that's about all I've got mm-hmm. for this passage. Well, especially <laughs> now, I mean, we are near the end of the season after Pentecost. We're about yeah. to get swamped with things like All Saints, and some churches will be doing stewardship work, and then those you know the last Sundays of the year are very much future apocalyptic oriented. So I mean, it's a chance maybe to check in and say, here's a text we read Mm -hmm. in a different setting. 
back mm-hmm. uh, on the, you know, the last last day of the Easter season. Right, right. And what have we what have we learned, or what's mm. you know to kind of do a recapitulation of life in the season after Pentecost is mm. um, the abundance I'm not sure what I would say exactly, but no, there's there's the abundance. It begins with the abundance of what has been provided, and yet we're not there yet. Uh, there's still more to come. The the uh, t- the getting to the promises of God is through suffering, through struggle, uh, through a calling out of what um, is the need for God to do what God alone can do. Uh, there's there's a movement of that at least in the in the verses. What is it? A, a nine eleven verses that are here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and this is the thing. It's the it's this this image of abundance, right? After all of the harassment they've gone through, whether it was actual locust invasion or military or who knows what kind of suffering they've gone through. Mm -hmm. God promises all of this material abundance, or I should say maybe agricultural abundance, restoring the land. But then it's like, oh, and by the way, I'm also going to send my spirit. Yeah, right. right, right. Which can, again, help reorient the church in all of the, and I believe strongly in the church's social mission, but but at the end of the day, the church offers something that, that other feed the hungry and alleviate poverty organizations don't quite promise in the same way. And Mm -hmm. so that again, help recalibrate a congregation's sense of what are we promising the world and what, how do we bless the world as this weird community? Yeah. And also I think, you know, verse 28, then afterward, I will pour out not only the promise of the spirit, but the promise of the spirit on all flesh. So it's, mm-hmm. which then really reorients sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Uh, if, if the spirit is poured out upon all flesh, then that also reorients dreams and visions and prophecy uh, mm-hmm. that where will you see uh, the vision of God, where will you see the kingdom of God when all flesh are participating in this prophecy, um, when all flesh are participating in this witness. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's, yeah, it's that that leveling of <laughs> the kinds of stratification that we, uh, that we perpetuate in so much of our lives that, mm-hmm. that this is then, uh, once again, that you know, how often we need to be reminded of the all flesh. And if um, we recognize that this is not the individual, but this is God's per- per- uh, per- um, promise, faithful promise for all the world, um, it might be a different way to look at the psalm. Ah, and, nice um, segue. Ah, thank you for that. Uh, so <laughs> this whole sense of the dwelling place, which becomes a home, a nest, uh, a place where it's for those who come together, if we think of hospitality again. So our hope out of this horror is a belonging and a hospitality. And to read that in that sense, to read the psalm in that sense, um, moves us to what does it look like when the people of God live as if the Spirit of God has transformed them. And it becomes a place where all the world belongs and finds their dwelling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. Especially to tie that in with, you know, the focus on the temple here, which is where the, uh, the, the action is set in the parable that Jesus tells in Luke 18. But then to talk about what does this mean now if, as if in the church, we understand the dwelling place of God to be mm. not just the community of faith, but exactly. also beyond, but in some ways there. Right. And so, what does it mean for us to host the kind of prayers that we saw back in the parable as well? Yeah. yeah as a yeah, place yeah. where the presence of God is to be. This is a community that welcomes both those kinds of prayers, recognizing um, God's justification is available for people on, no matter how caricatured they are, right? No matter how yeah. what, how extreme they appear to be mm-hmm. uh, in their in their vices and virtues. But mm-hmm. 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 
And so and we, we come have, to the end of sec, of Second Timothy. This is it. This is it. Yes, and uh, we have I, finished the race. We have fought the good fight. And I, I want to <laughs> lift up Stephen Fowles' commentary. Um, I appreciate the the way that he shifts that imagery just a bit. Um, and and for me, it began to recognize that this is about the journey. Um, he highlights the fact that. Um, the words are not that I have um, won the race, but that I've run the course, I've finished the race. And um, sometimes we, we need to realize that we're not set on a goal of what we accomplish, but we are set on bearing witness. If we think of the Timothy text from last week of being an evangelist, of, of giving voice to the promises of God, that this is, I've done my part. I've stayed with what my responsibility is, but ultimately this is what God is doing in the world, that God is the one who rescues, and so therefore the glory is to be God's.